Welcome to the City Current Show. I'm your host, Jeremy Park. We're always honored to bring you inspiring stories of individuals and organizations making a difference, empowering the good. And in this case, we're talking about the Tennessee Innocence Project. We're honored to be joined by their executive director and lead counsel, Jessica Van Dyke. How are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you? Doing well. So let's start with some context, some history. Give us some background on the Tennessee Innocence Project. Yeah, well, thanks for having us. Uh, We are Tennessee's only in-state nonprofit law firm dedicated to exonerating the actually innocent. So we get uh, applications, you know, calls for help from people who are in Tennessee prison serving a sentence. And they're saying, I'm actually innocent. I didn't commit this crime. And we represent them as they make those claims. Uh, This was something that I had uh, studied when I was at the University of Tennessee Law School in Knoxville. There was a legal clinic for many years that provided this sort of support, but it really wasn't on a full-time or a statewide uh, basis, which is really what we needed for these types of claims. So we launched in February of 2019, uh, and it's really exciting. We're now going into, we've completed our fourth year, going into our fifth, and, and really making some progress across Tennessee. So let's start with kind of where it starts on your end. You you mentioned obviously statewide effort and the exonerations, but when you talk about individuals reaching out, how do you start to kind of figure out these are cases that we can help with? Kind of start with where it starts on your end. Yeah, so we have an application process and uh, you can find part one of our application online, you can call our office, you can write our office, but we do everything through that application process. Obviously we love it when attorneys reach out to us and say, you know, I have a case I'm not too sure about, maybe you can look into this, but usually it starts with an envelope in the mail. And in that we see um, just letters from people who have been convicted of different crimes and we just start the vetting process. So we actually have a two part application And then once we get a completed application, we may spend six, eight months, even a year, just investigating that application to determine if it's someone that we can help with a claim of actual innocence. When you look at how things have changed with technology and being able to go back, what are some of the things that you start looking for with discrepancies, for instance? In other words, what are you looking for to figure out, is this a case that we can genuinely help out with? So there's a number of what I would call red flags. You know, these are the factors, the issues that we see time and again in wrongful convictions. And so we're really lucky there's this incredible nationwide database called the National Registry of Exonerations. And they keep track of all of the data. So when you hear a story about someone who was convicted and spent 30 years in prison, they actually dissect what are the factors? What are the reasons why this person ended up in prison? And from that, we are able to sort of identify those key things that we are going to be looking for when we get an envelope in the mail, when we get a letter from someone. Um, And so, you know, as far as new technologies, which I think is one thing that we think about a lot, that would be DNA, right? That would be fingerprint um, testing. It could be arson. So we know a lot more about different areas of science than we once did. And how do those new developments, those new technologies, how do they help us do a better job of determining if this person is actually guilty or innocent? Do you benchmark against other cities to look at kind of where Tennessee is in wrongful convictions and then carry that into for Tennessee? Do you see differences between the major cities like Memphis, Nashville, Knoxville, Chattanooga? Yes and no. So that's a really difficult number or statistic to benchmark for a couple of different reasons. One, the presence of what's called a conviction review unit, a CRU or a a conviction integrity unit, a CIU. That's a unit within the DA's office. And and in Memphis, y'all maybe have heard a little bit about that uh, over the last year. But we can talk about that in a minute. But to answer your question, wrongful convictions happen everywhere. The question is, What are we doing to correct them? What are we doing to identify them? What are we doing to right these wrongs? And so if you're working in the system with a partner, with a collaborative partner, like a district attorney's office who wants to right those wrongs, then obviously you may see a greater number of wrongful convictions in that jurisdiction, not because they happen more frequently, but because there's a willingness to acknowledge 
and accept and, and correct once you've learned that information. So when you talk about these specialized units, you mentioned Memphis. Go ahead and dive in deeper in terms of what's going on in Memphis. Yeah, so uh, after the district attorney's election last August, that was one of the issues in the election, was the establishment of conviction review unit. And that's something that the district attorney's office has, in fact, done. They've established a conviction review unit. And that's exciting for us because we work very closely with these units. And the general thought behind them is, if our client is innocent, we're going to give you every bit of information that we have and vice versa. We're going to work together because the ultimate goal, the ultimate thing that we're all seeking here is just the truth. And so we've done that very successfully in Nashville. And we hope to do that with the, the uh, unit that has been set up in Memphis as well. Yeah, that was my next question is, is there a unit in Nashville? So I'm assuming that answer is yes, correct? <laughs> That's The answer is yes. And in fact, we've had four exonerations since uh, we opened our doors. And all four of those cases were worked collaboratively with the district attorney's office in Nashville. So does that mean that Nashville is doing, you know, a worse job in convicting people wrongfully? No, that's not what it means. It means that we have put in place the procedures and uh, the methods to really analyze and make sure we're getting it right. And if we're not, then we're working together to fix it. Yeah. So when you look at the opportunities like you're talking about and the exonerations, a success story, you don't have to name names, but, you know, if you don't want to, but give give us a success story. Yeah. So, you know, we, we have had four exonerations. Uh, the first one was in August of 2021. And then in 2022, we had three exonerations. Uh, and those you can find on our website at tninnocence.org gives you all the case information. But in one of those cases, Ms. Watkins and Mr. Dunn were a couple that were convicted in 1988. And they were convicted and spent 27 years in prison for a crime they did not commit. Uh, and so working with the district attorney's office, that was a case, you know, getting back to your question about technology, that was a case where we looked at the medical science. We've learned a lot more about traumatic head injury um, and, and making proper diagnoses. And so that was a case where Jason Gishner in our office really worked with the DA's office and came together and, and realized what was testified to a trial about the medical evidence. It was not correct. It was wrong, in fact. And so they were exonerated last January. Um, and then another example of learning better technology, learning more information. Claude Garrett was exonerated last May. Claude spent nearly 30 years in prison for a, a murder he did not commit. And that happened, it was a fire, a house fire back in 1992. And the testimony that was given uh, at his trial was not scientifically substantiated. And we now know that. So in order to fix that correct, you know, to correct that, to fix that conviction, we had to bring in countless arson experts who testified this did not happen the way that they initially set a trial. When you look at going back and like you're talking about saying, hey, that didn't happen this way, but an individual spending 30 years of their life behind bars, what does that look like for them coming out? I mean, obviously it's got to be immense just freedom and overwhelming, you know, feeling of, okay, wow, now I can go live my life. At the same time, 30 years has passed. How, what, what's that next step then in terms of their, them stepping out in the world and, you know, access to support network and things like that? I mean, is there a kind of a next step on that side? So that's one thing we're working on right now. Uh, we've been around for about four years, starting our fifth year, and we've really been focused on the legal work. Uh, we have more cases. We, ha you know, the ones I've talked about are the the cases where we have full exonerations. We have many more cases in the pipeline that we're working on every day with our clients. The next step, I think, is for us to, as we grow and get the support, to establish what you're talking about that uh, wraparound service for people who are leaving prison because it is overwhelming. Uh, many of our clients went to prison before cell phones even existed or were, you know, everybody had one on their hip pocket. So, y yes, it, it is overwhelming. Uh, we've been really fortunate that the clients that we've had exonerated have had incredible families who've supported them and provided that support. But that's something that we personally are going to be looking to expand on is support for mental health services. Uh, you know, if you're an innocent person behind bars, there's a tremendous amount of um of grief, I think, with being put in that situation. So providing mental health services as well as those wraparound services, that's one of the next things in our um, 
kind of to-do list here at the Tennessee Innocence Project. Well, and as you mentioned, you know, on the history side, you've been doing it for a long time, but a relatively short time. And, and to your point, once you get more support behind you and can open up the floodgates and do even more, all of this becomes possible. But you already see, you know, these gaps and these potential opportunities to help even more. And so I think that's a, a powerful way when you start talking about the future and what's ahead and how the community can help to continue to build that capacity, but those opportunities, I think that's exactly, you know, an easy way for the community to start helping your efforts. Talk about kind of your vision in that regard for the future. So talk about, you know, kind of where you're headed with all this. Well, we have really big plans for 2023. We're adding on uh, staff. You know, we are a community supported nonprofit. There, we don't get any state funding. We get a small amount of funding from the Department of Justice and all of that's wonderful, but we are largely supported by the community um, and by the business community, corporations, law firms. So for us, we have really been pleased with the amount of support we've, we've been, that we've received. And we're actually opening another office. We're based out of Nashville. We cover the whole state. So that means if we have cases in East Tennessee, we're going to cover those. We're going to cover Middle Tennessee cases. And we're actually opening a Memphis office because we see such a need in Memphis. Um, and, and the highest number of applicants asking for help are from Shelby County. Talk about how this, in, in a big picture, plays an integral role in civil rights opportunities, as we were talking about, you know, righting the wrong. Talk about why this really should matter in a big way for the community at large, the work you're doing. We want to make sure that no matter who you are in the world, whether you're rich, poor, no matter what neighborhood you're from, that you are getting equal justice under the law. And when we look back at cases of innocent people, we can identify what are some of our weak points? What are some of the areas where the system gets it wrong? And how can we do better? Because it doesn't matter if you are wrongfully convicted of a misdemeanor or of a murder. Any sort of wrongful conviction can have a negative impact on your ability to get work, um, you know, potentially your ability to vote, to get certain types of jobs, go certain places. So it's really important to us to understand why wrongful convictions happen. And then how do we prevent them from happening? And all of us, you know, regardless of if you've ever uh, had any affiliation with the criminal legal system, all of us are better off when the system is functioning in the best way possible. So I think that's why our work is really important to everyone. And, you know, the bottom line is no one wants to see an innocent person behind bars. No one wants that. That's not the country that we live in. Yeah, absolutely. You mentioned the funding side. Go ahead and carry that forward into how the community can help your efforts. So I think the community can help our efforts by uh, definitely following us on social media and just sharing the stories, letting people know that this uh, these travesties can occur and that we can fix them. People can support us by making a donation. If you go on our website, there's a variety of ways that you can support us without making a donation. But also, if you know someone who's been wrongfully convicted or you're talking to someone, maybe you're a church or a supermarket and this topic comes up, tell them about us. Let them know that we exist because we want people to understand there is an outlet. It's a very slow process to overturn wrongful conviction, but that's what we do. We, we just want to help people. How has this work changed your perspective on the legal system, civil rights, justice? I will say this. I think the evolution of conviction review units within the DA's office is really important. And what it has taught me is is something that my colleagues say all the time. We don't need to take 10 years to get an innocent person out of prison. If we all work together, if we're all doing what's right, if we're all seeking justice, we can do it a lot faster. And the criminal legal system is so slow. You know, I think there's been some talk recently in Memphis about it taking a long time for for people to have trials, you know, the amount of time pre-trial at 201 Poplar. And I think we need to just be asking ourselves, should it be going this slow? You know, we want to make sure we're thorough. We want to make sure we have the resources. But can we be seeking justice more expediently? Because every day in custody is a day that somebody's not outliving their life. Yeah. 
Well, and I think it's powerful to know, just like you said, that you're out there fighting to make sure that uh, people have their freedoms who deserve their freedoms. And so I think that's an important piece, just like we're talking about. You mentioned it throughout, but go ahead and mention it again as we wrap up. Website, social media, where do we go to learn more and connect in with the Tennessee Innocence Project? We would love to have uh, folks follow us. We're on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. You can just Google Tennessee Innocence Project and all those handles are going to come up. And we're at tninnocence.org. You can find our application there. Some of the stories, the exonerations I've talked about, you can see there as well. How to get involved, it's on there as well. So we would love to have people check us out and tell a friend. Let us know, you know, let them know that we're out here doing this work. Absolutely. Jessica Van Dyke, Executive Director and Lead Counsel with the Tennessee Innocence Project. Thank you for all you and your amazing team do. Thank you for coming on the show. Thanks for having me.